fit, so that's going to fail. Let's run through these examples quick. Okay. Would, would the last D actually uh, sign like a null characteristic to it, or no? <coughs> no, because it's it's not the, the it's not the rest of the list. It's an explicit element. So after the last D, there is an empty list already that has the pattern match on top that must be fit on top of another one. I'll show that in the next pattern matching slide. I'll show that really okay. explicitly. Okay, so the examples that we were wondering about, oh, here's the forgetting of the variables. So let's say we say A equals 1, and later on we're doing some things, and now we want to do a whole new expression and say A equals 3. Well, now we get an exception because it's a no match. A is not an unbound variable, it's a bound variable. And A is one and the same as 1, the, the integer 1. And now we're saying that A equals 3. And what, it's not trying to bind that, what it's first doing is it's matching. It's saying, uh, it's saying 1 is not 3, and it's blowing up. So that can become kind of cumbersome in the shell when you're testing things. So there's two ways to handle that. One is the specific one, F, A. Now, A binds is fine. The other, the, this is like the, uh, the chainsaw sledgehammer model. It's just F with no arguments, which will unbind every single variable that you've ever assigned in your shell section. So I can again say A equals 3. But that's just not what you want to do. And I, it's not even legal uh, at runtime in your programs. It's a shell. A shell can be its own. So the pattern matching. Tuple of A, comma A. B equals 1, comma, 1, comma, 2. And <laughs> see what happens now. Let's try it like this. 3, comma, 3, comma, 2. So that wasn't, there was no binding involved there except for the B. The A was already 3, and 3 and 3 just pattern matched on the A. They fit round peg, round hole. And the two was an unbound variable that can hold exactly one thing, or sorry, the B was an unbound variable that can hold exactly one thing. That one thing is a two, so it's stored. So if I say something like B, B is two. Everybody get that? Yeah, yeah? okay, good. Same thing with list, same thing with that. You know, it, it, it's just it's a, a fitting operation. And there happens to be binding involved if things fit and you've got unbound variables. So into slightly more advanced pattern matching. And I definitely encourage you to, you know, as I'm going through these, just work them through on the shell and um, yell out when you have questions. I, I don't mind that. I do it. So just say when you have a, you have a problem, and we'll go through it uh, with everybody. So the first example here, A, B, pipe, C. So the pipe which we covered in really briefly previously, what the pipe says is, a, just think of it as saying rest. It's the rest of the list. So it's the tail. Tail would be probably the more common thing to call it. So A will bind here to one, B, comma, next element, two, pipe, the rest. So B or C is gonna be three, four, five, six, seven. That is, Pay attention to that one, it's going to be all over the place. The next H pipe T thing, you're going to write thousands of times if you walk out of this room and, and start programming your line. So H is head, head is an element, tail is a number of elements. So if I were to define this uh, algebraically, H is a single instance of a term, and T the thing that is behind the, the pipe operator is always a list of terms. That thing must be a list. So it, it looks like element, pipe, list of terms in that list. So here we go, that succeeds h to 1, t to 2, 3, 4. How about the, uh, the next one? So this gets to your question in the, is that a uh, This kind of gets to your question about that empty list. H 
pi t bounds to abc. Now, this can be a little bit confusing, but to you guys it probably isn't because I've explained it already. Um, there isn't one element. This is not a single element right here. This is two elements. The first element is abc, an atom, one thing. If you run a length on that list, you're going to see one. But, implicitly, mathematically defined, in that list, at the end, there is this implicit empty list, null list. That null list isn't going to get bound as an element. So if I wrote h comma t, boom, like it says, you can't take a two element list and bind it to a one element list. But, if we do a pipe and we say the rest of the list, that implicit empty list is going to get bound to t. So, try that. And then type, when you're done with that operation, type t, period, and you're going to see that your t is actually holding an empty list. That's going to be really useful in recursion to establish, uh, you know, how do we know when we're at the end of the list? Do we want to, you know, inductive? We can't, we can't look at the last element in the list that is a valid element and know that it's the last element in the list. We have to have some way of knowing that we're at the end of the list. We have to have some signal. Uh, this empty list is going to end up being that signal. H by T equals the empty list. That looks like a, a rectangle. It's not. It's two square brackets. It's just the font. So H by T equals the empty list fails because there is no first element. And now this last example here gets into a bit more of a complicated pattern match. But this is the kind of thing Maybe not exactly this structure, it's kind of a stupid structure, but uh, this is the kind of thing you'll do a lot of. So what we're saying here is that we have a tuple, and the first element is we don't know, we're going to bind it to A. The second element, we don't care, we're not going to bind it to anything. The third element is a list, we're going to pull out the first element of that list, and then we're going to, tell the, then we're going to grab the rest of it, but we're not going to bind the rest of it. So that underscore in front of the tail works, so this underscore here works exactly like that underscore there. What that's saying is, it's a more literate way of telling the compiler, I don't care. I wouldn't recommend using blank underscores. It's, you know, you have a language that goes to pains to give you this declarative ability and then we go sticking blank underscores in there, like what's that? You know, like it just it takes away from the readability of the language. So, Stick an underscore in front of a variable, and the compiler will not squawk if you never use that variable. It's just telling you I don't forget about it. If you go ahead and you use it later, the compiler is smart enough to figure out, like, for some reason you put an underscore in front of something you wanted to use, I'll actually find it. Question? Did you have a question? Mm -hmm. I think there was a hand raised. Was that nice? Um, I kind of had an error on the first one. I tried it. I'll, I'll run through it to Shell in one sec. Let's see if I think we can clear it up. Um, okay, so the last bit, and then we say comma, and our third element, or our fourth element, is a tuple with one thing in it. We're going to extract that one thing. So now out of all that mess, you know, when all is said and done, we've got A bound to ABC. We've got B bound to 22. And these 22s are the same, so that second B was just a pattern match. So what we did was we verified that that structure has the pattern of A being something, and the first element in the second list is the same as the value that is in the third tuple. Uh, if they weren't the same, if those weren't 22 and 22, that would have failed, and the system would have told us, no, those structures are, are not thought they were. Um, do something else, and we can do conditional logic based on that. I'll run through the uh, first 